Hi folks, this is Abel James and you're listening to the Fat Burning Man Show where we talk about real food and real results. Today's special show is with Yuri Alkaim, a former pro soccer player, holistic nutritionist, and many more things. He's an awesome dude, a good buddy of mine, really great show, so stay tuned for that. Before we get to it though, I just wanted to say a quick shout out to all those folks out there who are probably listening right now, who I met at Paleo FX this past week. It was amazing to see you guys, and I appreciate all of the support that you guys have given me. Uh, another quick announcement, we've hit number one in health in Australia, Canada, the United States, and a lot of these in the past week, so it's totally nuts. I really appreciate everything that you guys have done to support the show. Uh, let's see, you can go to fatburningman.com, uh, and as a special thanks to you guys for supporting the show and, and it going completely nuts in the rankings lately, uh, I'm offering 60% off my Lean Body 30 Day Fat Loss Program. So all you have to do is go to fatburningman.com, put your name in the email list, and you're going to see an option to grab it for uh, 60% off once you confirm your email address. So go ahead and do that if you're interested, and uh, thank you so much for your support. It's been totally awesome. All right, so now on to the show we, with Yuri. We talk about what holistic nutrition really means, how vegans go wrong, conversely, why you don't feel great when you eat heavy amounts of meat, and why characterizing a food by a single chemical component is absolute idiocy. All right, let's go hang out with Yuri. All right, folks, we're here with Yuri Alkame, a former pro soccer player, holistic nutritionist, and strength and nutrition coach. Yuri, my friend, how are you? I'm doing great, Abel. Thanks awesome. for having me, buddy. How are you? Awesome. I love your pro setup over there. <laughs> it's, it's awesome, eh? It's like a stack of magazines, little box, and then the <laughs> mic on top. You know, we, we're, we're high rollers here. Yeah, that's so the way it goes. It's, it's pretty cool. Yuri just had me on his show, and now we're doing this back-to-back, -back, so he's on mine. We're doing a, a true interview swap. Yeah. So we're, yeah. we've already developed that perfect rapport, right, Yuri? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So why don't we start just by... Uh, if you could define holistic nutrition for people mm -hmm. out there who have heard the term thrown around, it, it's starting to rise in popularity for sure, but a lot of people don't really know exactly what it means. So can you can you catch them up? Yeah, a holistic nutrition, the thing that I really resonated with with me was that it, it looks at the individual as a whole. As a whole. So it's not um, you have a disease, here's a specific thing to, you know, we, we don't attack the disease with chemo. Mm -hmm. You know, we treat the entire person, body, mind, and spirit. And that's, that's really what drew me to holistic nutrition is that it looks at not only the body as a whole, but also food as a whole. So instead of looking at foods as um, in fractionized components as being carbs, fats, and proteins, and then micronutrients, mm -hmm. it looks at food as something more synergistic than that. Because we all know that if you take a supplement versus a whole food, you get far more benefit from the whole food. And that's the difference between looking at things holistically. Right. Or you know more quantitatively, as as much of the the Western dietetic approach teaches. So that's the main approach. And you know, having gone through um, kinesiology and health sciences, kind of through the academia of of university, and having been, I was half a credit shy of a minor in nutrition, hmm. and I just decided not to do it because I actually. <laughs> I actually decided to do a course called Jocks, uh, sorry, Rocks for Jocks. Oh, really? It was a geology course for kinesiology students, and yeah. I loved it because I love that stuff. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm sick and tired of listening to all these dietitian PhD professors go on about the RDA for vitamin C mm -hmm. and how much like vitamin D we need or how much protein we need to – like it was just so – like calculatingly quantitative yeah. and had nothing to do with health. You know, it was all about, you know, instead of white bread, have whole wheat bread or yeah. I mean, like stuff like that. That's just absolutely ridiculous. So I said, you know what? Forget about it. So I'm going to do geology yeah. for my last uh, half credit. So <laughs> yeah. So then I went back to school to, stu to study holistic nutrition. And as I mentioned before, it, it literally just blew my mind. So yeah, yeah, it was amazing. So if the problem with uh, Western nutrition is that it's reduction to the to the point of absurd, absurdity, then how do you actually uh, take the holistic perspective but maintain support from science? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great point because I'm I'm really a science geek by nature. Like I love I love kind of blending the two. So I like bringing the holistic point of view of looking at the body as a whole, food as a whole, how they interact, but also understanding that there's a lot of wishy washy stuff out there and a lot mm -hmm. of ridiculous claims that needs support through science. Um, but having said that, 
just because we can't explain something right now doesn't mean that it's not true. Right. Right. And that's, I think that's very important for people to understand that is like we are where we are scientifically right now, which is awesome, but there's still stuff that we can't explain based on our lack of technology or whatever it might be. Right. But that doesn't mean that that does not exist in nature. Yes. So, th- you know, that's something that, and, and like you talked about in our podcast about how like you want to, you encourage people to, to eat how they, for how they feel or how they want to feel versus how they look. And I think that's a great statement because with, um, with me adding more raw foods into my life really changed my life. Cause I was, I was sleeping like 12, 13 hours a day for really? like 20 years of my life. Yeah. Like, like crazy. Holy smokes. Yeah. Like just a waste <laughs> of life. So technically I'm probably really 15 years old right now. You, know, you take away all the sleep. So I was never very energetic and I didn't realize and nor did any doctors ever mention that the, that could be caused by my food. Sure. Uh, what I was eating because I grew up on a diet of processed foods. I used to race my brother home from school to see who could get the last uh, hot dog out of the fridge. <laughs> you know, like just stupid stuff. Um, so yeah, so when I was when I, when I was introduced to more of a holistic nutrition kind of perspective and, and adding more raw foods and more real foods into my diet, I literally changed my life in the space of about four to six weeks. Wow. Uh, instead of sleeping 12 hours a night, I was sleeping, you know, five to six and feeling energetic all day long really and none of the stuff i was doing is supported by science necessarily Mm -hmm. like i was learning about like the energy of food of of this kind of this life force sure you know if you have cooked broccoli versus raw broccoli you can there's different types of technology that can show what's called um i guess the aura or the life force coming off that food it sounds like complete bs when you talk to the kind of the real science nerd part of people sure but when you experience that, you can't deny that. You can't deny how amazing you feel when you eat those kind of foods. And for me, whether that's supported by science yet doesn't yeah. really matter. Yeah. And it's irresponsible to think that just because something isn't supported by science today that it doesn't mm-hmm. exist. Yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of at least the best scientists out there would absolutely 100% agree with that statement. Um one, and I've talked about this on a few other shows that I've been interviewed on. I don't even think I've talked about it on my show. Uh, but the, the state of science is that you, you automatically assume that we know everything, mm-hmm. right? Which yep. is completely erroneous. Like we are, not only do we not know most things, but we're wrong about a lot of things that we think are right, right now. It's, it's the egocentric human mentality, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And so you kind of need to start dipping your toes into the woo-woo stuff mm-hmm. if you want to actually experience something that is outside of our current understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, there, was, there was a great book that I read a few years ago that, that changed my perspective on food, actually, somewhat. Uh, and it was Chi Running. I don't know if you've come across that. I've, I've heard it. I haven't, re- haven't, uh, haven't read it, though. Well, it's, it's uh, supposed to be about kind of being a better runner. Mm-hmm. But he starts talking about the, the Chi within foods and, and talks about the difference between uh, you know, a microwave meal that's, that's completely dead and has mm-hmm. been dead for some time, and then you like shoot it with radiation, and it's supposed to be health food because it has so many calories or so much fat or yeah. so little fat or whatever, um, compared to eating something that was just plucked from your backyard. And there is, there's life in that food. And maybe mm-hmm. we can define it with science, maybe we can't, but it's something that I wholeheartedly believe and I've experienced myself and in hundreds and hundreds of my clients. When you go from eating dead foods that could survive on a shelf or... Uh, or that could, you know, magically not spoil for whatever reason for long mm-hmm. periods of time. Compared that to eating f- like farm to table type foods, it doesn't even matter like what foods they are. Exactly. The changes in health are incredible. And it's just, it's. I mean, if you just kind of step back and just look at, kind of step outside the whole picture and look at, you know, just if you're an alien coming into this planet, you know, and and be like, okay, well. I'm going to grab these foods from my garden, which is mm-hmm. coming out of the soil, which is the way it's supposed to be. Or I can take these packaged foods, take off the cellophane wrap or keep it on, put it in a microwave. I mean, it's just, it's just so intuitive. Like, which one do you think would be healthier? Right. I mean, do we really need a scientific study to, to tell us that? You know? yeah. And that's really interesting, too, because there are so many things like that that most people understand, mm-hmm. but their habits don't indicate that they understand it. For example, yeah. uh, like everyone knows that sugar makes you fat. Right. Like everyone knows that. I I don't think anyone would would debate that. But at the same time, they'll go and pick out uh, foods that are very low in fat, 
because it's lower in calories mm -hmm. and they add a bunch of sugar to that and they'll look at the label and be like, well, yeah, it has, you know, 30 grams of, of proce highly processed sugar in it, but it's healthy because it's only a hundred calories yeah, exactly. uh, or it's low fat or it doesn't have any cholesterol or something like that. And so there's this disconnect between what we kind of know is true, but mm -hmm. the way that we actually act. And totally. so I, how do you address that with, with people you work with? Well, my uh, my rule of thumb is uh, don't eat at, don't eat anything that's advertised on TV. So that's that's the <laughs> that's first thing. That's my rule too. <laughs> so that's a pretty simple thing. And if you look at you know most food that's in your grocery store, mm -hmm. um, if it's on the outside, if it's in the produce aisle, that's yeah. pr pretty much not going to be advertised on TV. Right. Um, the other thing is like I think people need to understand how to read nutrition labels if they're going to be buying packaged foods yep. more more intelligently because I think a lot of people just look at the the front of the box or the package and they see low fat, zero calories or zero sugar, whatever it is. Yeah. And they assume that, oh, this is good. Uh, uh, this is better than this one. Mm -hmm. Low fat yogurt is better than full fat yogurt. Why is that? Uh, yeah. Because somebody told me that low fat was better and fat, you know, is, is killing us. Again, it's all misinformation that's, you know, that's that's been propagated for decades. So it takes like a level of, of kind of self investigation and kind of into learning this kind of stuff through ideally good information, good sources of information, yeah. because otherwise we're relying on popular media for, you know, for telling us, okay, well, this yogurt is, I can, I can, I can guilt free enjoy this yogurt because it has zero calories, but it's okay because it's pumped full of aspartame. <laughs> they don't tell you that aspartame is a neurotoxin. Yeah. So, you know, this is, I, it's just, you know, it really, I think the problem is that if we were taught about health and nutrition and not like sex ed in, in kind of high school, if we were taught this stuff from a very young age, we'd be a lot better off because yeah. most people go through 20 years of, of school or from the time they're young to the time they graduate without any idea of how their body works, about, about like anything with respect to health. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're supposed to understand what happened 300 years ago in some war <laughs> and if we don't get the right answer we fail the class i mean yeah. how like how does that even make sense i mean right. it's just ridiculous yeah i, rem I so. remember we were in health class and the the health teacher was a, a good probably 80 pounds overweight and she was teaching mm -hmm. us about nutrition and uh not to say that people who who don't you know walk the walk can't have something useful to teach but it was what she was teaching was was wrong <laughs> especially looking back at it, it was absolutely yeah. absurd and yeah. and she did have her degree in in nutrition and i just thought that that was you know thinking at the time i thought it was a little bit ridiculous um but thinking back i mean this is what this is how kids are being taught about mm -hmm. food if they're taught at all um, i know but another thing that, that you brought up too which is so interesting is that uh especially what the the commercials and the traditional media tries to teach us uh, under the radar anyway, is that we can trick our bodies into eating the foods that we still want to eat or having like all of that, that sugar or fatty flavor or mm -hmm. disgusting whatever and, uh, and have your cake too, right? Yeah. So like the, the very idea that you can have a soda that's, like you said, pumped full of aspartame, guilt-free, and then it has absolutely no effect on your body because it has zero calories is absurd. If, mm -hmm. if we all take a step back and think about that, like, one soda that's pumped full of sugar has very terrible effects, but one that's pumped full of this, you know, newfangled chemical has absolutely zero effect. So it's totally fine. You can drink as much as you want and you're going to be healthy because you're doing it. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And I think more people well, need, to, need to say that. Yeah, I was, I was actually, I just did a podcast episode the other week about this whole food addiction thing mm. and doing some research, um, came across a really interesting book called... Uh, what was it called? Like I think it was called like Sugar, Fat, and Salt. It's by Michael Moss. It's a relatively new book out there about f uh, how these companies are. They employ like neuroscientists yeah. to formulate their foods to basically compel us to eat on autopilot, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And they have a term they use called um, vanishing caloric density, yeah. which means that if a food, like let's say you're having Cheetos, right? You eat the food, it literally dissolves in your mouth before you even swallow it. Your brain doesn't think that you've actually eaten anything because there's no connection between your stomach and brain at that point. Yep. And it's just like, well, I haven't had anything to eat. I'm just going to eat more. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, it's crazy. It's, uh, and then and like there's, there was a big study at a Duke university that showed with, I think it was, they did it with mice. 
um, that mice eating yogurt that was sweetened with aspartame or one of those artificial sweeteners actually gain more weight because the sweetness that was supposed to, basically when you have something sweet, it's supposed to signify to your brain that a certain number of calories are coming in afterwards. Yep. But when that was kind of, there was a disconnect there with the artificial sweetener because there was no calories coming after it. So they consume more and actually gain more weight. Right. Um, so yeah, slowly but surely, I think more and more information is coming out that is, is kind of hopefully stirring people in the right direction with this kind of stuff. Again, if it's if it's not natural, I mean, you know, it's like the age-old debate. If you were to drink like regular Coke versus Diet Coke, I mm-hmm. mean, which one would you choose? I mean, that's that'd be that'd be pretty tough. I wouldn't want to be in that situation. <laughs> no, but there are a lot of interesting studies that say that if you reach for the Diet Coke, you're going to gain more fat for exactly the same reason that you talked about before. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, you can't really have your cake and eat it too. And and yeah. it's funny too because like people will go and I have addressed this on my show before, but people will go to buy food that has less food in it on purpose and spend mm-hmm. more money doing so, you know, like with fewer calories or whatever. And that's yeah. just so ridiculous. Even if you, if you compare uh, low fat yogurt with high fat yogurt, which one is going to make you more full, the full fat yogurt, because oh. fat is very sati- satiating. And so like people are, are trying to like, they, they cost the same amount of money, but they're trying to buy less food, <laughs> which is a little bizarre when you think about that too. And then they eat more of it, so right. they don't really get ahead. Exactly. And yeah. uh, so what, one of the things that I tell people when they switch to this style of eating, and when you go from eating fake processed foods to eating you know, farm-to-table, very high-quality meats and veggies and eggs and that sort of thing, it, does, uh, it, it can be a lot more expensive, especially at the beginning. But mm-hmm. there's, there's no more bang for your buck than like a stick of grass-fed butter. I mean, that will get you full pretty quick. So if you're a starving college student, like forget the Easy Mac, just like stock up on a bunch of butter and put it all over everything. (laughs) Yeah. But then again, you got, oh my God, my doctor says I shouldn't eat butter. I should be choosing. Actually, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can uh, show you this. I took, I was in the gym and I took a picture of, of the absurdity of the Canada food guide. Um, I'm going to put this up to the camera to see if I can kind of see if you can see this. I'll put it on the blog too. I don't know if you can, can you read that at all? I can't read it, no. Okay, so basically I'm just going to, It's. I just uh, took a picture of one of the sections that was on oils and fats. Yeah. And I'll just read it to you. So th- again, this is the Canada Food Guide. Be very similar to the U.S. Food Pyramid. Sure. Um, it says, include a small amount of unsaturated fat each day. This includes oil used for cooking, salad dressings, margarine, and mayonnaise. <laughs> all right? Mayonnaise Use is healthy? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Use vegetable oils such as canola, olive, and soybean. Choose soft margarines that are low in saturated and trans fats. Limit butter, hard margarine, lard, and shortening. So like 70, 70% of the, the statements in those four points there are just complete ridiculous. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so frustrating, you know? And like even watching Dr. Oz. I think Dr. Oz has done some great stuff with respect yeah. to getting people more aware. But then again, he'll have people on there that are cooking with canola oil. Yeah. You know, and it's just, I don't know. So, yeah, slowly but surely, you know, one day at a time. Yeah. Oh, so this is interesting. Um, Having a Canadian on the show Mm -hmm. speak about um, the ever-beloved rapeseed. (laughs) Because that's that's one of your huge industries up there. Huge. Big time. So uh, what do Canadians think about canola? Um. Again, for the most part, unless you're a health conscious, like unless you're, I would say for the most, not that I do, the thing is that I don't spend as much time in grocery stores anymore than, yeah. you know, f- from what I used to. But I think the the idea is that people are still scared of fat and they've been led to believe that canola oil, because it's a vegetable oil, is good for us. Mm-hmm. And we know that that's not, not necessarily true. Um. So, yeah, so I think, you know, based on the fact that it just, it takes up like an entire aisle in the grocery store, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's put in these, I don't even know what kind of quality plastics they're put in, but probably not good ones, (laughs) just kind of sitting in the grocery store forever. Yeah. And, you know, once you understand the processing of these oils, it's, it's really, really, it's shameful. It is. And the worst part is that in Canada, we have something called the Health Check Program by the Heart and Stroke Foundation. You probably have something in the States that's similar. Yeah. And I was on breakfast television a couple of years ago uh, talking about this. So the health check program, basically the Heart and Stroke Foundation will put a health check on a food that it deems is heart healthy. Yeah. So 
all of these canola oils have these health checks. And it's just like, it boggles my mind. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yep. We have and, a very similar thing. Oh, it's, but it's just such a money grab because these companies are paying millions of dollars to the Heart and Stroke Foundation to have these health check approved uh, products. And when I was on breakfast television talking about this a couple of years ago, I had about 30 products on the table. Mm -hmm. And the producer of the show said we have to we had to use black tape to cover up the names. Okay. Because they're like uh, Campbell's Soup is a sponsor of this show. So, oh, you know, you can't uh, Yeah. You can't talk about that. That's why uh, I don't even have though advertising. It, <laughs> yeah, even though it has 1500 milligrams of sodium in one can right. and it's still heart healthy. Yeah. So yeah, so I don't think uh, we're there yet with respect to canola oil. Mhm. Mm However, I was at a coffee shop a couple months ago. One lady walked in, she ordered a muffin, um, which is, you know, another story, but she actually asked for butter, not margarine on nice. the muffin. And she told the barista, she's like, uh, she's like, no, like, I understand that margarine's not good for us. And I was like, I should have stood up and got a picture with her. Yeah. As like the one Canadian who gets it, you know, that I've That's seen in awesome. person. That so it was, so it was awesome. Yeah. I remember uh, for a lot of paleo folks, they'll go to Chipotle because it's one of the very few um, somewhat responsible places to go and get Yeah, it's a great restaurant. Food. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's see, one of my paleo friends asked the person behind the bar, they, they saw that they were squirting oil, oil all over the meats that they were cooking and, uh, and some of the rice and that sort of thing too, the veggies as well that were cooked. And she was like, what, what kind of oil is that? And the dude behind the counter was just like so excited that she was asking that question. And he's like, it's soy oil. It's so healthy. Oh. We're really proud of this. And we're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, good to know. I did not know that. So now yeah. I know. I, and who knows if that's, you know, something that every Chipotle does. I'm not sure. Uh, um, I bet it is. But that dude was pretty stoked about it. And unfortunately, it's it's hard, you know, when you're eating out, even the best possible case, uh, that often happens. You know, even great restaurants will use canola or soy or, or, or some sort of industrial seed oil. Yeah. Um, at home we use duck fat and butter and <laughs> the good wow. stuff. I didn't know you could get duck fat. Oh yeah. Well, what we actually do is we, uh, we'll take a duck. We usually mm -hmm. have duck like once a week. My girlfriend loves it. I love it too. Yeah. Uh, I just had duck yesterday. Did you? Nice. Yeah. It was wicked. <laughs> and it, I mean, it, that's one of the most luxurious meals you can have and it's really easy mm -hmm. at home. It's as easy as, as making a chicken really. Um, and, and so we just capture the fat that comes off the duck and there's a lot of it. We pour it into a bowl and then we cook eggs in it and we cook other veggies in it and stuff like that. It's very it's stable, it lasts a long time and it's Excellent. it's absolutely delicious. And it's uh, it's actually pretty cost effective when you do it that way. Um, yeah, buying duck fat, you can get it at Whole Foods and places like that, but it's usually like 10 bucks for a little thing of it. But if you just yeah. cook a duck, then I mean, you have you have as much duck fat as you could go through. That's the way to do it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. So That's let's cool. talk a little bit about um, you. You obviously were into raw food for a while. You still are. Mm -hmm. um, you know a heck of a lot about about vegans. And there's kind of this. There are two tribes there. Even though it's it's very very similar, like we were talking about on your show earlier, mm -hmm. um, the the approach between paleo people and vegans, but. There's a lot of bad blood between these two groups. So I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on, on that whole thing. Vegans there's, versus there, paleo. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of bad blood just within the raw vegan community. I mean, yeah. there's people that are like crazy fruitarians who think that you should be eating 30 bananas a day and that's it. <laughs> yeah. And even if you grew up in Scandinavia where bananas are not even native, yeah. you should still be eating them. Right. Um, so there's those radicals. And then you've got people who are you know, a little bit more kind of inclusive and, you know, a little bit more about, okay, this is, this is a real, a real life. We're not going to live in the jungle. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I, I think even with that said, just within the, within the vegan kind of branch of, uh, of food, there's a, there's a big, uh, there's a big separation because you can be vegan and not be healthy. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the Oprah Vegan Challenge, sorry, Oprah's Vegan Challenge. I didn't see that. Which one. she did, I think it was about three years ago. So she had a, uh, a nutritionist on there who took Oprah through Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And it was just, un I couldn't believe what I was seeing. They stopped at one of those, um, I guess, refrigerated aisles. And she was picking up like tofurkey, all these uh, soy sausages. And it was all about, well, if you can't eat hamburgers, have this soy burger or yeah. have this and this and this. And they went to the checkout and the whole shopping cart was packed full of products like yeah. not food mm -hmm. and I, I just i just thought i'm like okay this is reaching millions and millions of people 
And this is now their perspective of what vegan is. Yeah. It's, there was not a single fruit or vegetable in the shopping cart. And it was, it was pretty frustrating because I've known a lot of vegans in my time who, you know, for ethical reasons, don't eat meats for sure. animal products. And that's, that's fine. But their, their diet is based on breads, pastas, cereals, and they're no, they're, I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if, if, if it was the option between that mm -hmm. and having a piece of meat that was grass fed mm -hmm. organic, I would choose the meat any day of the week. Yeah. Right. So I, I, it's, it's kind of frustrating that like everyone has their reasons for doing things and that's fine. But I think if health is the goal, you, you have to look beyond the, the soy based products and all that stuff. And really, you know, it's, it's about coming back to real food because you can be yeah. vegan and be very healthy. You can be vegan and be a, a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And same thing with paleo. We were talking about that yeah. before too. You can you can eat the worst possible foods on the planet and still be 100% paleo and, and totally. kill yourself pretty much. <laughs> or you can eat very responsibly and have pretty much the healthiest diet on the planet doing yeah. the same thing. Um, so what, what does that mean day to day for you? What does it look like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks, that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, usually I'll wake up in the morning, uh, I'll make a green juice. Nice. So kale, spinach, uh, cucumber, celery. I'll put an apple in for a bit of sweetness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge believer in alkalinity. So I think one of the best ways of improving your health and energy is really to get more greens in. Yeah. And a very simple way to do that and really to, to, to benefit from the full spectrum of nutrients they have is to either blend them or to juice them because you can break down the cell walls and actually access the nutrients. Yep. So I'll start off with about a liter of green juice in the morning uh, on most mornings. Then I don't actually eat as much as I used to. So mm -hmm. I probably have, I'll do a green juice in the morning. Then I'll just do my work, do whatever I have to do. Then by lunch, uh, I'll go up and make a smoothie. Because mm -hmm. again, I'm, I'm very lazy. I don't want to prepare foods. Yeah. So unless my, unless my wife is making something, like she's making a quiche right now. Um, but it's an almond flour based quiche. So no wheat, which, so I'll oh, probably wow. have that for lunch. Nice. So it's awesome. Yeah. But if I'm the one responsible for making the food, either it's going to be a, a green smoothie or a berry smoothie where I'll throw in, for instance, uh, banana, some frozen berries, uh, almond butter, hemp seeds, and some goji berries if I have them on hand. Okay. So that'll that'll make me like a whole thing of Vitamix, like the whole like liter and a half of it. Yeah. And then I'll just bring that down to my desk and I'll just like literally just kind of keep pouring in my cup <laughs> all afternoon. And then dinner time is usually my more substantial meal where I kind of like I'll actually prepare something. Mm -hmm. So. Most evenings we'll have, well, we'll definitely have a salad. Um, usually there's going to be some meat involved because mm -hmm. my wife is more of a meat eater. I'm more of the, I don't like meat all the time. Yeah. But I do enjoy a good, you know, piece of fish or, or, or chicken or um, the occasional, you know, steak. Mm -hmm. So it really depends. Like I would say I probably have, um, I'd probably have the meats based dinner two or three times a, uh, two or three times a night. No, two or three <laughs> times a week. It sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then the other times it, it could just be something really uh really just i don't know i mean uh just really simple i might just have a salad with some like a niswa salad where i'll chop up some egg hard-boiled egg put it in the salad and i'll just have a huge bowl of that nice um or i'll make some of the just some of the more kind of elaborate raw recipes like a raw zucchini pasta mm -hmm. with uh fresh marinara sauce wow yeah that sounds really good Oh, it's <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> what about treats? Do you have any of those that, that sneak in there? Oh yeah, that's so my downfall is is the sweet side. Mm. Um thankfully we've we've really I think we've zoned in on 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 mastering this. Uh I have a good buddy, uh, Eric Wong, who has a great pro, uh, great program called the Dessert Angel that his wife created. Yeah. And it's all about gluten free, sugar free. So he sent that to me a couple months ago and I was just like, dude, this is amazing. Yeah. Because it's it just it's perfectly in line with everything I with with everything I teach. Cool. So we started, you know, doing all the recipes and now we've got a couple of staples from that program. I've got a bunch of staples from my eating for energy programs. I've got like a raw chocolate mousse, um, different recipes for like raw chocolates, but even those are a little bit higher on the maple syrup side sometimes. So if we wanna kind of cut the sugar, yeah. Uh, we're really try we're really experimenting now with a lot of healthy foods that are again paleo friendly. So there's no wheat, no gluten, mm -hmm. no garbage, uh, based around almond flour, coconut flour, and we're using xylitol or stevia in place of maple syrup even, just so we reduce the glycemic index of those foods. But we yeah. still get that kind of uh, that sweet fill, if you will. Yeah. 
So yeah, both my wife and I love uh, love dessert, but we yeah. just figured, you know, if we're gonna have it, we might as well make it as healthy as possible. Right. No, we yeah. do exactly the same thing. My uh, yeah. my girlfriend Allison also made uh, about fifty desserts. We were doing a, a desserts cookbook a few months mm -hmm. ago, and I know a lot of the folks out there already have it. But yeah, I was. I think I I sampled at least thirty eight desserts in two weeks. There was just this. <laughs> we were taking pictures of everything and. Cooking. What a gift. <laughs> oh, it was, it was wonderful. Um, yeah. But it's amazing what you, what you can get away with when you start eating responsibly. And it's it's almost impossible. If you have like a real cookie mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's made of real food, you know, tends to be higher in fat and fiber mm -hmm. and uh, might have some veggies in there. We, you know, like red velvet cupcakes. We actually make yeah. beets and nice. uh, like cobblers with zucchini and stuff like that when you when you have foods like that you don't really eat 15 cookies it's not like oreos it's like you have one you're like wow that was really good you may have another one but then you're just full mm -hmm. it, it's kind of your body naturally knows that you've had your fill um your sweet tooth is like you've kind of checked off that box for the day and then yeah. and then you're done and that's it's such a beautiful way to live because you don't have to completely avoid all of these foods you don't have to feel deprived mm -hmm. um when you eat them responsibly and, and cook them in, in, a, in a good way. But I'd love to hear a little bit more. I haven't gotten, uh, even though I talk about this in my book quite a bit, the, the whole idea of uh, acidic foods and alkaline mm -hmm. foods. Um, can you talk a little bit about why that's important and why people should be thinking about that? Yeah, so this is really, really interesting. So basically, the way it's measured is through something called PRAL or potential renal acid load. And all that means is that for any given food that you you consume, um, it's broken down for uh, acid base kind of purposes uh, into this PRAL equation, which is essentially protein plus phosphorus. So that's whatever the food kind of gives off in terms of that, mm -hmm. minus the alkalizing minerals, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So it's a very simple equation. So if you eat a food that has more protein and phosphorus in terms of after it's metabolized and what it gives off, versus those minerals, it's considered an acidic food. Okay. So generally, uh, animal products are higher on the, on the acid side. Dairy is probably the most acidic. Grains are still acidic, but c closer to neutral. Mm -hmm. And then fruits and vegetables are more alkaline because the relative amount of protein and phosphorus versus the minerals of the alkalizing minerals they give off is a lot different. Mm -hmm. Green vegetables are the highest source of alkalinity. And so now that you have that kind of spectrum, uh, the reason it's important is because our blood needs to be slightly alkaline. So our blood, all the fluids in our body have different pHs. So our stomach has a pH of about two, which is very acidic. It would kind of eat through your finger if you were to dip it in there. Sure. So don't, you know, <laughs> stick don't your finger that. down your throat. <laughs> um, your blood needs to be about 7.4, which is on a scale of 0 to 14, 7 being neutral, 14 being very alkaline, zero being acidic. Um, the blood needs to be about 7.4. The reason for that is because in that state, your red blood cells are able to flow freely throughout the body. Mm -hmm. When the blood becomes slightly more acidic, there's a negative charge around your red blood cells which becomes stripped. And when that happens, your the electromagnetic forces or the electrostatic forces that are repelling the red blood cells from each other. So if, you know, if a healthy red blood cell has a negative and another one has a negative, they don't stick together, so yeah. they repel. If that dissipates, one has, a, like, let's say one has a negative charge, one has a, a positive charge because it loses that negative around it, they start to stick together. Mm -hmm. And this is why when it, like, coming back to energy for a second, if you want to feel more energetic, all it's about is getting more oxygen to your cells. In order for oxygen to get to your cells, your red blood cells, which carry the oxygen, need to get there. Mm -hmm. So if they're all stuck together, they're not able to flow freely, first of all. It'd kind of be like driving on the highway during rush hour versus driving at 3 in the morning. Yeah. And if they're all stuck together, they can't get through the tiniest capillaries very effectively. So they're not able to deliver the oxygen efficiently. So from an energy perspective... That's a very, very simple reason why so many people are, are, are tired and lethargic. Mm -hmm. And if you're tired and lethargic, it also follows that you're probably also very unhealthy at some level. Yeah. Uh, very simply, if you feel energetic, not in like a crazy caffeinated way, but just in a natural, sustainable way, chances are you're probably decently healthy. 
if you're tired all the time, if you had to sleep 12 hours a day like I did, yeah. um, you're not very healthy. I mean, I, I developed an autoimmune condition. Uh, oh, it was, really? Yeah, and it was all part and parcel of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the other reason that this whole alk alkaline, sorry, acid alkaline balance is important is that cancer cannot grow in an oxygenated alkaline environment. This was first discovered by Otto Warburg, who won a Nobel Prize for this. And so if your cells are not getting oxygen, mm -hmm. that also means that they start to depend on sugar for energy. So this is known as anaerobic metabolism. And that becomes a big problem because sugar becomes the fuel source for cancerous growth. Right. And as an example, cancer cells have about 38 receptors for sugar. Normal cells have about two. Mm -hmm. So this whole, um, it's a very fundamental uh, thing that we need in our blood, uh, which is very, very important on so many levels. And that's why, like, I have nothing against eating animal products. And I think, like, even with paleo, I think it's great because they emphasize so much on eating green vegetables and vegetables in general right. to really counterbalance the acid coming from the animal stuff. Yep. Um, but, if, but going back to the vegans, right? If you're a vegan who eats um, cereals, pastas, and breads, you're essentially very acidic. Yeah. You know, if you're not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Right. Um, so it really, uh, like having that understanding is very helpful for being able to make some very small, simple, but radical changes in, in kind of improving your health, your vitality. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, that yeah. brings up, <laughs> I met a vegetarian not too long ago who didn't like vegetables. I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever. How heard. ironic! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they were pretty much subsisting on on, on products and breads and cereals, and yeah. uh, not particularly healthy looking or or acting or feeling it, unfortunately. So yeah, it's it's very important just to eat your veggies, and and so many people people get the wrong idea about that because I know that uh, for a, pe a period of time, anyway. Most of the veggies, especially in the winter in New Hampshire, when we were growing up, we didn't have a whole lot of money at all. Um, we would eat those those frozen packs of like diced up veggies. You know those things? Yeah. They all yeah. like with the little peas and the carrot cubes and whatever the heck else, the lima lima beans they put in there, and everything tastes the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just it's like disgusting. frozen water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that's not what vegetables are, and that's not what what we mean by by telling people that they should eat their veggies. We're talking mm -hmm. like the real stuff that was just alive and well. Um, yeah, the the more yeah, we, that you we, can eat that, the the better off you can be. Yeah, we actually started um, a garden last summer, and I have no nice. idea how to garden. Yeah, and <laughs> it was. I mean, we we botched half the garden, like half the stuff we planted didn't grow. Sure, but what did grow? Oh my god! Like the flavors are just unbelievable. Yeah, you know, you, you can eat tomatoes like apples. Oh, I know. In the backyard. We, our two year old, we had to prevent him from going back to the garden because he would just go to the tomatoes and pick every all the tomatoes off. Really? And you just eat them. Wow. Sort of like, okay, Oscar, they're not <laughs> so they're cute. not ripe yet. They're still green, you know. But he was just uh, he loved them, so it was, it was great. Kids who love veggies. That's yeah. <laughs> so that's that's my goal, and that that's actually a really important point. Like I've been really adamant about feeding our our. our we have two sons. Um, our oldest one's two, so really getting him in the uh, in the habit of enjoying healthy foods. Yeah. So for instance, when he was a little bit younger, he used to drink green juices in the morning, green smoothies, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Then he started getting introduced to some sweeter foods, so his palate changed a little bit. You know, we go for dinner and stuff like that. Sure. And now reintroducing the green juice in the morning is not happening. Oh, really? So <laughs> he'll settle. He he actually really enjoys like a berry smoothie because it has more of a little bit of a sweetness to it. Yeah. But it just goes to show how quickly our palates can change. And if you're not used to eating vegetables, sure they're gonna they're gonna suck. They're not gonna taste good. Yeah, a cupcake's gonna taste a lot better. Right. But if you make the the commitment to getting rid of the sugar for for a short amount of time, it's amazing the flavors that come out of natural foods, especially right. the ones that you can grow in your garden or get at a local farmer's market. They're just it's amazing. That's true. Once your uh, your palate isn't completely blunted anymore by the yeah. ridiculous amounts of sugar, salt, and fat, and all that stuff, mm -hmm. um, it, it's amazing the flavors that you can find in, in almost everything that you eat. These things that you wouldn't expect. Even oh, yeah. you know, like you drink coffee in a different way once you start eating real food and avoiding the nasty stuff that's playing tricks on your mind and your your totally. palate. You can yeah. start to appreciate all of these amazing flavors in everything that you eat. Yeah. Well, cool. It's, we're, sorry, go sorry, ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say we're almost out of time. So, <laughs> <laughs> Shucks. I know, right? 
Yeah. Well, th- this has been a blast. Thank you so much for coming on. But um, why don't, before we go, just tell folks out there where they can find you and what you're working on now. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff out there. So the yeah. best place is just go to my blog, which is urielcame.com. And then from there, you can kind of see what we're up to. And it's probably the best place to follow my stuff. And can you spell that for folks just in case? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, when I go to Starbucks and I tell them they ask for my name and it's they're like, "How do you spell that again?" Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so it's y u r i, e l k a i m as in Mary dot com. Awesome. Well, Yuri, thank you so much. You're welcome anytime. You're thanks, buddy. Just dripping with knowledge about this stuff, so it's always a pleasure to talk. It's to what you. I do. It's what I love. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, thank it's you so fun. much, man. Thanks, buddy. It's been a pleasure. Cheers.